On January 15th of 2022, planet Earth gave us a bit of a surprise. One of the largest eruptions we've ever seen. The eruption of Honga Tonga volcano that destroyed 90% of the entire island where it was located, creating an enormous plume cloud that was several thousand kilometers across. While also generating a very powerful sound wave that traveled across the planet several times. As a matter of fact, this was one of the loudest sounds ever produced, at least in modern history. Even being detected by various seismological stations around the world and GPS satellites, they detected slight disturbances in their data. But in the last few months, there have been some updates and some really interesting discoveries about this eruption, and we're going to be discussing them today. Starting with this recent study, that as always you can find in the description below, where the scientists were able to design an algorithm that used the seismic detections from the volcano to estimate the amount of volume ejected by the volcanic eruption. In the process, discovering that this was the largest explosive eruption of the 21st century, equivalent in power to the 1991 Pinatubo eruption in the Philippines. And so by using a similar algorithm, the scientists believe they can now actually calculate the eruption power of very remote volcanoes and thus study volcanism without really being on site. While at the same time being able to predict how much volcanic ash is going to be released by a certain volcano and thus predict if the volcano is going to be very disruptive or potentially very damaging to people nearby. You can learn more about the research in the paper in the description below. Then, by using data from a lot of different GPS satellites, some of the scientists were quite surprised to find out the extent of the effects of the volcanic eruption and the length of these effects as well. First of all, it became apparent that a lot of the atmospheric waves created by the explosion were actually active for at least four days after the eruption, and also ended up going around the planet at least three separate times. For example, here is the altimeter data collected by these GPS satellites approximately a couple of days after the eruption. You can see the waves moving back and forth. While at the same time, all of this caused a lot of the disturbance in the upper atmosphere, including what's known as ionosphere that we're going to discuss in a few minutes. And so the shockwave that you see propagating right there was actually traveling around the planet several times. In this case, this is a shockwave that was detected by measuring the water vapor levels using a satellite known as GOIS-17. But it's really the effects on the ionosphere that were most surprising and to some extent most unusual. So first of all, one of the teams using the pictures from satellites was able to estimate that the volcanic ash rise to the altitude of about 58 kilometers or 36 miles, with some of the other stuff like gas, steam and ash even reaching mesosphere. And that's actually believed to be double the altitude of the Philippines volcano in 91, the Mount Pinatubo. And following this, it took approximately 13 hours for all of this plume to disperse. But ultimately, some parts of the plume were able to almost reach space. As you can see, it was actually at an altitude of about 85 kilometers. This was surprisingly calculated by looking at various shadows formed by the plume itself. Now normally, in order to calculate an altitude of a cloud, the scientists will use the measurements from infrared instruments and some of the models that compare simulations with temperature and altitude. But in this case, the method relies on the idea that the temperature will decrease at higher altitudes. Yet we know that once you go high enough in the atmosphere, something different happens. The temperature can actually start going up. And that's sort of what started happening with the volcanic ash which made it almost impossible to calculate the maximum altitude. And so some of the scientists from one of the papers below managed to find a different solution. They used a stereoscopic observation using two different satellites to create a three-dimensional picture and then use some of the shadows to calculate the maximum altitude that way. In the process, obviously discovering that a lot of the stuff stayed in the upper atmosphere for a very long time. A lot of the volcanic ash, including things like sulfur dioxide, carbon dioxide, water vapor, and so on, eventually get distributed across the entire planet with aerosols persisting in the stratosphere for at least a month. Although in this case, we believe it might even stay there for at least a year. But at the moment, the calculations suggest that it's probably not going to influence the climate of the planet for the next year or so, or even change the average temperatures on the planet by more than half a degree. Nevertheless, because a lot of the material in this case reached the upper atmosphere, including of course the pressure wave, all of this ended up even influencing ionosphere and reaching outer space. In this case, two satellites measuring ionosphere, such as NASA's ICON, also known as Ionospheric Connection Explorer, and ESA's Swarm satellites, 
discovered that a few hours after the eruption, there were quite a lot of extremely fast winds and very powerful electrical currents formed in the ionosphere. That's of course the region on our planet where we usually detect things like aurora or a lot of other electrical activity. And so this eruption ended up electrifying some of the upper layers of the ionosphere, creating one of the biggest disturbances in outer space we've ever seen. And so in this case it's believed that as the volcano erupted and pushed this huge amount of gas, water vapor and dust into the outer atmosphere, it ended up creating extreme winds that expanded into the upper atmospheric layers. With certain winds moving at speeds of over 200 meters per second, a little bit slower than a typical jet airplane. And this is also the fastest winds ever measured by these missions. And as the winds propagated in the upper atmosphere, they started to influence some of the particles in the ionosphere as well. For example, there is an electric current phenomenon in our atmosphere known as the equatorial electrojet, EEG for short. And it turns out after the eruption, this particular jet increased in power by approximately five times and also ended up flipping its direction as well. Instead of going eastwards like usual, it even started flowing west for a short period of time. And this is something that's only been seen before during extremely powerful geomagnetic storms coming from our sun. And since these electrojets are usually associated with the movement of material in the ionosphere and can even disrupt satellite communication or radio signals, it sort of suggests that powerful volcanic eruptions do have a very similar effect to a geomagnetic storm, something that nobody has ever thought of before. Although it's still not entirely clear how all of this works and why this effect even occurred. Some of the explanations suggested that it's something to do with the phenomenon known as the lamb waves, the waves that are generally able to travel around the planet without reduction in amplitude. But that's just a preliminary explanation and at the moment it's still unclear how this particular eruption affected so many parts of the atmosphere and ionosphere. Although it's pretty clear now that a typical volcanic eruption does have a lot more influence than we originally anticipated. But I guess one of the bigger questions that currently we can't really answer is why exactly was this volcanic eruption so extremely powerful? What exactly happened here to cause such a huge explosion? Well, one of the explanations suggests that there was a small eruption very likely a day before. And because of this first eruption, a bigger part of the volcano ended up sinking underneath the surface of the ocean. And then, as all of the molten rock during the second eruption started to come out and interact with seawater, it vaporized and ended up intensifying the eruption that would be slightly less powerful otherwise. As a matter of fact, the vaporized seawater very likely caused a lot of the lava to turn into tiny pieces of ash. And when all of this combined with ice crystals in the upper atmosphere, this also ended up creating a huge amount of static charge, creating something like 10,000 lightning strikes per hour and representing roughly around 80% of all lightning strikes on planet Earth during that particular day. With the research in this case suggesting that the violence of this volcano was really due to the fact that it was an underwater, a submarine volcano. The combination of energy from the eruption along with the mixture from water and atmosphere ended up releasing way more energy than was possible otherwise. And because we know that this volcano erupted previously, for example here's a picture from 2015, with the eruption being just a little bit less powerful but obviously not creating the same effects, this particular suggestion does make a lot of sense. So mixing water, volcano and certain atmospheric conditions does produce way more energy and creates dramatic effects that would be impossible otherwise. But I guess for now that's pretty much it. That's kind of all the scientists have learned in the last few months about this unusual and mysterious volcanic eruption that really shocked the world on January 15. We'll definitely be learning more though because a lot of studies are still ongoing. And once we learn more, I'll make sure to follow this up with the next video. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, maybe share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and come back tomorrow to learn something else. Support this channel Patreon by joining the channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.